So for those that are going to be listening to this message uh, via podcast, we are just about to launch into an alumni summit. We just finished up a semester, five-week semester, so students have left and a new group are coming in, but it's, it's a very unique time for you know, me as a leader, for our, our team to go through that. If you were a student in the five week and now you're staying to the next one, it's a very weird time for you guys to, you're saying goodbye to everyone and saying hello to a whole bunch of new faces. Very unique thing to go through as the body of Christ. Uh, but what we're headed into is so precious and so potentially life transforming. But it's a week where we focus very specifically on what we're calling the missionary mindset. And we shouldn't need a sermon to remember the missionary mindset, but I could say that about every single truth in the kingdom of heaven. Truth in the kingdom of heaven is different than facts in math. Because you know, I could say, yeah, we're gonna give a message this morning on two plus two equaling four, and you would say, I don't think that that's necessary, Eric. I think all of us have that down. And you would probably be right. However, the basics of Christianity are different than the basics of math and science just factoids in this world can be held on to, but there's something about spiritual truth that has a quality to it that if you don't exercise it, you lose it. And so you could understand the frame of it, but the substance of it is lost. And the idea of the missionary mindset needs to constantly be cultivated in us. I've seen it in my life in a big time way. Everything I'm about to say, you're going to nod along and go, amen, amen, know that, know that. Of course you know that. You're a believer, right? This is what we're built for. We're built to deliver the goods of the unseen realm to this world so that through us, this world would encounter Jesus Christ. I mean, we know what our assignment is. We're to bear fruit that is pleasing, that showcases what otherwise no one in this world could see, that through our lives, they would behold him. All right, we know that then why is it that we so quickly forget why we are here and we find ourselves running around dealing with life circumstances, the cares of this life to survive, to make it work, to you know, somehow make it from this paycheck to this paycheck, to somehow make sure that you know, this is in order, this isn't falling apart, we've got a leak over here, stick your finger here. We have so many issues in just living life that by the time you've just gotten your life stable enough, you know, you know, plugging holes where there's leaks, it's really hard then to say, all right, now let's deal with my missionary call. There isn't enough space there. There's not enough margin there to deal with this grand thing that we've been called to. And it's like, God, if you gave me, what, 30 hours in a day, you know what, that would really help. Just think about that. If you had 30 hours in a day, you'd have a bonus six to now deal with your missionary call. And what's funny is imagine that you know, life was really built on 12-hour days, right? And what would we be saying? God, if you gave me a 24-hour day, I mean, I would be dangerous on this earth. You see, no matter how much time he doles out, we're going to find more things to care about and be concerned about, other houses to build, other businesses to start, other clothing decisions to, you know, you know stress over, you know, new hairdo options that we could consider, uh, now they have apps, you know, where you can see what you look like with a beard. All growing up, I, w- I always wondered what I looked like with a beard. Now suddenly my kids can say, Daddy, this is what you would look like with a beard. <laughs> a very fine looking man, I must say. So you're saying, is that why you still haven't started growing one, Eric? So it's amazing how we can fill our time. And I want us just to put our finger on that one phenomenon that we can fill our time with all sorts of things that the Bible doesn't command us to do. And for whatever reason, the things that God does command us to do, we say, God, I, I'm going to have to ask you to have me excused on that one because I got this going on, I got this going on, I got this going on. And all of those things that you're putting on your fingers that are going on can be justifiably important sounding. I mean, yeah, I mean, I could see why. I mean, if you ever heard the excuses in the Bible, you know, this guy just got married. Well, marriage is of God. And so what is wrong with that? You know, this guy just bought a piece of land and he wants to go look at it, which I always thought was one of the funniest statements. He's like, you didn't look at it before you bought it? I mean, what was going on there? And, and yet, that, that pull that we have even towards good things, there, it's not bad to buy a piece of land and it's not bad to go look at it. It's when buying a piece of land and going and looking at it hinders you from fulfilling something even 
more important. Again, I, I give this illustration a lot, but the algebraic order of operations, you guys ever heard me bring that up? <laughs> PEMDAs, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. I know some of you just had a flashback to your junior high, uh, high school years. Junior high, that would be impressive to have that in junior high. I think it's in high school. And yet, if you try and solve that mathematical equation in a different order, and do not follow the order of operations, you will, in fact, get the problem wrong. Even if you're great at multiplication, but you skip the parentheses. Even if you're wonderful at subtraction, but you did it in the wrong order, you will get the overall algebraic problem wrong. And the same is true with our life. We could do all the other things correctly, but if we're missing out on primary action in our life, and God says, yeah, but didn't I ask you to do this? I didn't ask you to do this, but I'm not saying it's bad, but this is what I asked you to do. Now, if we were to build our life around that mentality, you could imagine that it would actually alter each one of us. That's why a message like this is a little scary, I have to admit. Last fall, I went through a series called Daring to Do with Stanley Dale, and Dan and Sandy had been in Belize, and they came back, and it, the sub title of that series, uh, which I would highly encourage you to go through, uh, the subtitle of that series was Because the Unreached Can't Reach Themselves. And you know, you know you're setting yourself up for problems when you start giving a series like that, right? And it was deeply convicting. The whole thing was. Dan and Sandy, I don't remember if it was the first session, the second session, something in there, they had just arrived back from Belize, and the next thing you know, they know for certain that they're supposed to leave Windsor and move to Belize. It's like, talk about some backlash. I, you know, Sandy was like my right hand. And now suddenly I give this nice, powerful message on the missions field, and she left. <laughs> so watch what you speak about. Who knows what I'm going to lose in this one? The whole church is gone next week. I'm like, you know, preaching to empty seats. And that would be a good problem to have. You know, if you have empty seats because everyone's going on the mission field, I have to admit that's about as good a reason to have empty seats as you could get. So at risk of having empty seats, let's progress into not just today's message, but this entire week of focusing on that missionary mindset, the mindset that we must adopt as believers and we must allow God to cultivate as a priority and not as something that if we have time, we can get to. The unfinished task. So Eric's current unfinished task I have quite a few of them. Uh, every time I just walk around my house, I'm like, oh, I need to get that done. Yeah, I need to get that done. But there's an illustration in my backyard right now that sort of fits this message. And uh, I have, I've, I've had to redo my landscaping in the back uh, backyard of my house because of various things. We've been short on water uh, in my neighborhood, and it looks like the water's back, but that loss of water and the extreme drought conditions and the fires, I guess, two years ago, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure COVID had something to do with it too, right? <laughs> but I have just, I don't know if it's a disease or something, a blight that hit different pockets of my, my lawn, and if any of you are like me, you know, a lawn is sort of like a representation of your character, you know, and how your lawn looks, you know, you can see straight into someone's soul and how their lawn looks, how they care for their lawn. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I grew up. So it's, it's been a unique thing for me to walk through because my lawn wasn't looking too good uh, out there. And so I've been tearing it up and I have all sorts of uh, things. You know, I have a guy, a landscape guy that uh, is more slow, like in his movements. He's, he's an older guy and he moves very slow. He's very good at what he does, but he moves at a slower pace. Because originally I was like, if we could have this done by July 4th, then I can have the students come over for our annual July 4th you know, festivities. And we watch the, the fireworks from our backyard. Well, we weren't even close uh, when it come to, came to that. And so as a result, we had to cancel our July 4th festivities in the Ludi backyard, and we ended up doing them here at the, the lake house, and it was, it was delightful. But now we have another event this next week, and that's the alumni are planning to come over on Thursday, and we have an issue. I don't know if you could guess what the issue is, but my backyard is all torn up, right? And that's, you know, that's not the easiest thing to know how to deal with. And so here's the principle. As long as there's an unfinished task, that which the, is truly designed for, which is to have the alumni or the students of Ellerslie enjoy, right? But there seems to be a hindrance until the, fast, the, the, the task is finished. 
Now, what I just described is the idea of the unfinished task is that when it is done, then actually they can come. Or in the kingdom of heaven sense, when the task is finished, the king can come. And that's actually a mentality of missions throughout the ages and generations that is hard for us in our modern era to truly digest because it sounds a little odd. And one of the reasons it sounds odd is it sounds like it has something to do with us. It's like, well, when the task is finished, well, who's responsible for the task? You could look around the room, it's like, I think that's us. Yeah, but I think we all know there's no way we can carry out that task without the power of grace anyway. So technically it's God in charge of completing the task, but he is chosen to condescend to use a vehicle, which just happens to be us. And so in a strange sense, we participate in the finishing of a task. And when that task is done, the king can come. And I don't know about you, but that's about as exciting as it gets. And so it's like, okay, what do we need to do to finish the task? And that should be the attitude of every single one of our souls. We lean in and we say, okay, God, what, is, what needs to happen to get this task completed? What is the task would be another good question. So uh, this is a quote from the book Evidence Not Seen, which I know many of you have read, but if you haven't read it, it ranks up probably in the, my top five uh, biographies, Christian biographies that I've ever read. It is so good. In fact, it could be in the top three, but I'm hesitant to give it such a illustrious position, you know, haphazardly as I'm talking here. But it's Darlene Dibler Rose. She is going to be over in Indonesia uh, in, for most of this story. She's a missionary over there. And the quote that I'm going to give you, and I gave you a little subtitle, it's, When Darkness Settles Upon the Dark Mountains. So the region that she's come to is the unreached region of Papua New Guinea, and, which now is like uh, Indonesia. But it is called the Dark Mountains. Okay, that should let you know up front. People die here, uh, and they don't survive here. And there's multiple reasons for that. First of all, the terrain is steep cliffs, uh, sago uh, thorns six inches long. I mean, could you imagine? The most poisonous type of snakes all around that are like as long as the room that we're in. It's just like terror, danger. But that's just the beginning. Then you run into the people who are controlled by demonic powers that do not want the gospel to invade their territory. And there, there's a lot of bad things going on, things like <clears throat> cannibalism, okay? Uh, and so this is, this is a terror territory. And this young woman, newly married, she can't wait to get there. And so Darlene Dibler shows up with her new husband, Russell, and everything is beautiful. They're taking steps forward, but then... The worst thing happens. The Japanese invade the islands. It sees, this is the beginning of World War II, and she happens to be in a very, very dark place. So darkness descends upon the already dark mountains. Now she is in a house. Her husband has been taken away to like a concentration camp type of a situation. And uh, because remember, they're, they're from America. That doesn't bode well when you're in you know, a Japanese-held territory at the moment. And so... Now she is in a house, but they're in lockdown. They can't get out. Uh, they have to stay there the whole day. And she is with this old man named Robert Jaffrey. And Robert Jaffrey would be one of your heroes if you knew who he was. Uh, he is one of the great statesmen of, of missions uh, for the past 100 years. And he's just a great man of God. And so she's in there with him, and he is sitting in a chair with his eyes closed. And so we're going to pick up the story at this exact juncture. So there's a picture of uh, R.A. Jaffrey uh, recognizing a great missionary statesman. So Darlene says this, Just days later I read the verse, Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Joel 2.28 I closed the book of Joel and arose from my knees. Walking into the hall, I saw before me a partial fulfillment of that prophecy. There before me sat the old man dreaming his dreams. His eyes were closed, but I knew he wasn't sleeping. One hand rested on, a, on an open atlas, the other on the arm of the winged chair that had belonged to his father. I knew that by faith he and his Lord were moving down the great chain of islands known as the Netherlands East Indies. Sensing my presence, Dr. Jaffray looked up and smiled, the smile of one who had sweet communion with the Lord. 
I was sure that God had, has acquiesced to all Dr. Jaffrey's proposals concerning reaching the lost, for this too was the great burden of the heart of God. How often I had heard Dr. Jaffrey remind the Lord of the verse, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me, Isaiah 45, 11. I looked down at the very familiar atlas. Had we not traced the rapid advance of the Japanese on its pages? What other places had fallen under their dominion since that fateful day when the island of Celebes had been overrun? His mind was full of warfare too, but not the same warfare that dominated my thoughts. I knelt beside the chair and listened to his dream. Lassie, and I can't do the Scottish accent that would be befitting this, but so just you know, go along and imagine a Scottish accent. Lassie, this is our task. These are the areas we must enter when this war is over. When this war is over, it was but beginning. How much more of its fears and anxieties, separations and grim tales of death must we experience before it was over? I suddenly saw Dr. Jaffrey as I had not seen him before, old enough to dream dreams, young enough to see visions. To Dr. Jaffrey, our experiences were but passing events that never altered God's program of reaching the unreached. Never could they mar the old man's dream. With steady hand and the voice of one assured of victory, he traced upon the map our coming campaign, the Natuna and the Anambus Islands, Sumatra, ferreting out and mopping up those pockets of satanic resistance in the central and southern districts, the final liberation of the Punans of Borneo's hinterland, Bali, firmly held in the grip of the enemy, would be freed, its iron gates yielding under the onslaught of faith and prayer. He paused to give praise to our commander-in-chief for spiritual battles fought and won in some of the smaller islands, then moved on to Mazul, the Isle of Demons, the Bird's Head of New Guinea, the Whistle Lakes area, the Zwart and Membrano River Valleys, down either side of the Karsten's backbone, and at last his finger came to rest over the Grand Valley of the Ballium. This, Lassie, is our task. Listen. Do you hear it? The sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees. It is the noise of the marching army of young men and women whom God is preparing for the day of spiritual battle and occupation of these areas. I realized how little I know of what makes a true missionary statesman. Of a faith that never staggers at the promise of God, no matter how incredible to the natural man its fulfillment seems of a trust in the unchanging one who keeps the heart at rest and unperturbed in the changing world, of a burning love that counts not life dear unto itself but is expendable for God, and of a vision that is never dimmed. Were not these the qualities that characterized pioneers down through the centuries? Were not these the elements that gave the drive, the impetus that launched the missionary campaign of the Netherlands East Indies in 1929, the year of depression when others were retrenching on all sides? Were not these also the characteristics of the godly men and women in the homeland who knew a God whose supply is not modified by the world's economic situation? So if you know the history of World War I to World War II, there's something that's going to hit right in between, and that is the Great Depression. In fact, America is in the Great Depression at the start of World War II, which is one of the reasons it is totally stuck on its own issues and unable to deal with world issues. However, if you were to enter into this very living room scene, I think you would probably be even more shocked because Darlene is already on the front lines with a passion for the unreached. <laughs> we have a few steps sometimes to even get to the point where we would even consider, even be willing to pray and say, God, I'm open to such a calling. And so here's a woman who is shocked as she witnesses a true missionary statesman. A man who is not affected by the fact that the Japanese just took over the island. The Japanese seem to be taking over the entire Pacific. There is a point in World War II where it would appear the Japanese are actually going to defeat the Americans and begin to invade the California coastlines. And if you were a betting person, you would have said, yep, that's about to happen. The fact that the tide turns at Midway Island is so startling in World War II as needing to be called supernatural. God still had a purpose for America, and he preserved it. And yet, way over in the Netherlands, East Indies, it sure doesn't look like God has a purpose for this country other than darkness. It was already dark. Now the Japanese are controlling it. If you stand against the Japanese, they'll brutally torture you and kill you as an example to anyone else who may get the idea. And right now, they're being held hostage 
Darlene Dibler is going to be considered uh, a spy uh, and that she is, you know, toting around secrets because she supposedly has a radio. All these different things are going to come. She's going to be put on death row. I mean, this is intense stuff that is happening. And what she is going to see is something that all of us need to see. You see, when something like COVID lockdowns sweep into town, I don't know if you guys remember those. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's sort of hard. They're a little blurry in the back of our mind. Uh, but when our world feels like it's falling apart, it's interesting how you can easily begin to turn inward and think about survival instead of what Dr. Jaffrey is thinking about. This man, in that moment, is dreaming dreams. He has his finger on the atlas, and he's tracing the plan of God in this earth. And for Darlene, she can't quite get past the fact that the Japanese are outside her door. She's stuck in the moment of terror instead of realizing that, wait a minute, I want to dream along with this man. You see, what his dreams are are God's dreams. God's dreams don't get quenched because of things like world wars. Things like COVID-19, that doesn't cause God from saying, I am after this world, and I want to reach the unreached. You see, the things that shut us down don't shut God down. And there is something very, very important here if we can see it. In the time of a Great Depression, which is what's happening here, still America's in a Great Depression, and so the economics, imagine being a missionary, and where's your support coming from? from a country that's under, in, in the midst of a Great Depression? That doesn't sound like a very hope-filled situation. And now you're in, a, in the dark mountains with darkness descending upon her. You could understand why she might feel a little insecure, financially, physically. Uh, I mean, her husband has been stripped from her. He's in some concentration camp somewhere. She doesn't know where he is, doesn't know if she'll ever see him again. That's a very destabilizing situation, that none of us really are that excited to say, sign me up, Lord Jesus. And yet God is going to use this woman to massively impact this territory of the world. But she has to see a vision beyond where she's at right now. And for every single one of us in here, there is something bigger than where we're at right now. There's something bigger than our own individual vision, our marriage vision, and our family vision. In fact, the greatest way to have an individual vision and a marriage vision and a family vision is it needs to be swallowed up into a greater vision. That's the healthiest way to develop that vision. Why do you have this life? Why do you have this body? It's not to just somehow survive for 89 years before passing away and to live as healthy as you possibly can and then to have grandkids. You know, that's, that's not a vision that is truly encompassing your real reason why you were entrusted with this body. Why were you given that marriage? What is the reason God designed marriage? just so that you can be happily ever after with someone and give some kisses and some hugs and write some love notes? Is that the great purpose of why marriage was given? Or is it a carrying device to reveal something to a lost world? Why were we given a family? So those visions need to be swallowed up into something greater. So Darlene continues, here beside me was the man who had spied out the land and was the first with the first wave of troops to go ashore in Macassar to stake a claim for God. Once again, the world was enveloped in sorrow and difficulties, but these dark days of war were to Dr. Robert Alexander Jaffrey, the great missionary general, but days of retreat in which to plan the strategy of yet greater conquests. I like that. I dropped my head on the arm of the chair and found that there were tears on my cheeks. That afternoon, I reminded God that I was available. And never would I call my task common or mundane if it were part of the culmination of the old man's dream. For that afternoon, I had seen a vision of the unfinished task. Have you guys seen the vision of the unfinished task? I would say for me, I've seen it, and then it gets blurry. And then I see it, and then it gets blurry. And sometimes it gets really blurry. Where if you ask me theologically about it, I'll say yes and amen. However, it's not absorbing my attentions. My attentions are stuck on family issues, how I'm gonna make it through this. It could be a financial issue, it could be running Ellerslie issue, it could be the fact that I need to speak today, I have this many messages. On, on Thursday I realized I had nine messages I needed to prepare in the next week, right? And like most of them needed to be prepared before the end of Friday. So, you know, when I see that, I, the bigger vision can sometimes, you know, get lost. The whole time I could be doing a message on the unfinished task. That's what's so ironic about it. 
That's why it's also good. There's nothing quite like, for those of us that are busy people, that are very full in the service of the Lord, to constantly come back to this. And remember, what is this all about? The every creature vision. So we're going to do a little more reading. Sorry, it's a very unusual message in that sense. But I'm going back to some of my favorite moments in Christian missionary history, just to sort of encapsulate them for us, to sort of stir us afresh. But the every creature vision, if, you, if you've ever read Reese Howell's Intercessor, that immediately triggers a memory. And that's where it's from. It's from the book Reese Howell's Intercessor. I'm going to call Reese Howell's the man of action. Our son Reese is named after Reese Howell's. Norman Grubb, who wrote that book, says, The autumn of 1934 was a wonderful time in the college. Mr. Howells was spending many hours in the early morning alone with God, going through the four Gospels and getting great light from the Holy Spirit on the life and person of the Savior. He seemed to be coming to the morning meeting straight from God's presence. Mrs. Howells, who knew the Spirit's ways with him, was conscious that the Lord was preparing him for something. On Boxing Day morning, December 26, the Spirit began speaking to him even earlier than usual. Before he had risen, Mrs. Howells, who was also awake, heard him repeating, Every creature, every creature. At three o'clock that morning, he was so conscious that God wanted to say something definite to him that he dressed and went to his room downstairs. There the Lord asked him if he believed the Savior meant his last command to be obeyed. I do, he replied. Then do you believe that I can give the gospel to every creature? Without stretching a point, he answered, I believe you can. You are God. I am dwelling in you, the Lord said. Can I be responsible for this through you? For years, Mr. Howells had been praying for the gospel to go to the world. Before he went to Africa, the Spirit brought before him God's promise to his son in Psalm 2.8. He had not let a day pass without praying that the Savior would make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. It was in willingness to be in some measure the answer to his own prayers that he had accepted the call to Africa. Then while in Africa, he had been struck by chapter 9 of With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray, which comments on the Savior's word in Matthew 9, 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Murray had pointed out on the strength of this verse that the number of missionaries on the field depends entirely on the extent to which someone obeys that command and prays out the laborers. And the Lord had called Mr. Howells to do this. That, in turn, had been one of God's ways of preparing him for the further commission to start a Bible college. Thus, for years, he had been a man with a world vision. But this new word from God was to lay direct responsibility on him. It was no mere assent to the general command to preach the gospel to every creature. It meant, if accepted, that he and all who took it with him would be bond servants for the rest of their days to this one task, to intercede, to go, to serve others who go, to be responsible for seeing that every creature hears the gospel. The way this commission was interpreted to Mr. Howells in concrete terms was that in the next 30 years, the Holy Spirit would find 10,000 channels from all over the world, men and women, whom he would enter and who would allow him to take complete possession of them for this task, even as years before he had taken possession of his servant. Reese Howells came out from his room, a man with a vision and a burden which never left him, the every creature vision. He brought it before the staff and students and New Year's Day 1935 was given to prayer and fasting. The presence of God was felt in a very real way. And while they did not minimize the enormity of the task, a deep and growing conviction took possession of many that God was going to do a new thing. It was a conviction that as, as really as the Savior came down to the world to make an atonement for every creature, so the Holy Spirit had come down to make that atonement known to every creature and that he would complete it in their generation. In a new sense, the world began to be their parish. They began to be open for God to lay any prayer on them that would further the reaching of every creature with the gospel. They became responsible to intercede for countries and nations as well as for individual missionaries and societies. The college truly became a house of prayer for all peoples, Isaiah 56, 7. One form that this prayer warfare took was intercession on a national and international level concerning anything that affected world evangelization. Every creature must hear, therefore the doors must be open. Their prayers became strategic. They must face and fight the enemy wherever he was opposing freedom to evangelize. God was preparing an instrument, a company to fight world battles on their knees. If any of you have ever read that book, you know what I mean by stirring. It is deeply stirring because it's going to show the body of Christ functionally getting in position to fight 
the battle for world evangelization. I mean, most of us are trying to just survive. We're trying to pay bills. We're trying to just make simple decisions in life and to, to actually organize our life to pray strategic battles for the doors in Iraq to open to the gospel. It just seems, you know, a little extreme, guys. I mean, how in the, who has time for that would be another question. Those who make it a priority, I guess, is the answer. You see, for many of us, our priorities are not centered around every creature here in the gospel. And I guess for all of us afresh to just lay out the priority of God and say, what is his order of operations? What does he say is the priority? And we know that love is chief, but what does love do? What would love do if it invaded your life? Yes, it would focus on marriage. It's not going to diminish that. Yes, it would focus on your children if you have them. Yes, of course. And yet, why is he going to cultivate a marriage and family? What is it for? You see, there is a primary reason why we have been put here on this earth. Why, when we believe in Christ, he doesn't just vacuum us home. But he actually instead sends his spirit to dwell inside of us. What is he up to? What is his game plan? Well, he has a desire to use you to share his light, his life, his truth, his gospel with the nations. The promise to the son. Psalm 2.8, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now, some of us sometimes struggle with knowing what to do with that verse. Who's it talking to? Well, it is talking to the Messiah, the Christos in the, in the Greek, Jesus. You see, he is the son, and he is in a position to make a request. And yet, that's what's interesting. When we believe in Christ, then we share in his position, we share in his inheritance. What does that mean, then? In a strange sense, we are in a position that for the glory of God and for the sake of Jesus... We are to go after the nations as his inheritance. And so even though that is so large compared to where most of us live, that's what Jesus is about. I still remember, and I'm sure the students in here are familiar with it too. Once you hear the story, it is emblazoned upon your soul. But the Moravian missionaries, as they were traveling to that island that that was controlled by a slave owner, and the only way to get to that island to reach those slaves with the gospel was to become a slave themselves. And so they basically gave themselves to indentured servitude for a lifetime so that they could reach the slaves on that island. And as they're pulling away in the boat, as they're getting further and further away from the shoreline, one of the Moravians raises his hand into the air and shouts out, is not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering? And of course, all of us know the answer to that question. Is he not worthy to receive the reward of his suffering? Is he not worthy to receive the nations as his inheritance? And of course, you know the right answer, right? If this was a, you know, I'm going to pass around a a piece of paper and say, okay, guys, true or false, Jesus Christ is worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. Well, of course, you're going to have to say true, right? All right, what does that mean to you then? Especially if you are his key uh, tool, mechanism to bringing that about. What are you willing to do for your Lord who is worthy? The missionary revival. So I don't know if you've noticed, it depends on how sensitive you are to dates and times, but both of these things, these quotes in different parts of the world are happening at the same time. In other words, it's right at this great depression time in the world that God is going to actually awaken. Something about this time period right before World War II and then even through World War II. During World War II, some of the greatest missionary advancements are taking place in the world. And yet, the world is focused on its crisis. Meanwhile, God's like going after the lost. I mean, it's, it's truly profound to see how God is not giving up his plan because the world has issues. He is going after the world and bending its, its knee to declare him Lord. The missionary revival. So uh, the man to raise up workers. So A.B. Simpson is, uh, A.W. Tozier is going to write a book about A.B. Simpson. If you were going to, could you imagine having A.W. Tozier be the one to write your biography. Okay, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. And A.W. Tozier is going to write A.B. Simpson's biography. It's a great book. 
Here's a little piece of it. The book's called Let My People Go. Oh, sorry, guys. This is one, he did write A.B. Simpson's biography, but this is taken from Robert Jaffrey's uh, biography. So sorry, after building that up, now I quote a different book. About this time, a missionary revival had begun to make itself felt here and there in the United States and Canada. A.B. Simpson was one of its leaders, partly the cause and partly the results of it. Under his inspiration, the school, indeed the entire Alliance movement, flamed with missionary zeal. All human learning, all theology was directed to this one channel. The hope of Christ's return, which had spread among the churches with something like prairie fire or rapidity, gave added urgency to the missionary passion. This was especially true of the doctrine as Simpson interpreted it. According to his view, the second coming was contingent upon world evangelization. Christ could not return until the gospel had been preached among all nations for a witness. The conclusion was plain. The Lord's return could actually be hastened by zealous missionary activity. One had a direct bearing upon the other. One theme ran through the preaching and writings of Simpson, bring back the king. Why say ye not a word about bringing back the king was the reproachful text often used in those days to arouse slumbering interest and to incite zeal for world evangelization. Though many learned eyebrows were raised at this interpretation, its practical effect upon its adherence was terrific. Nice, nice exegesis and sober analysis would never want for advocates. Mere Bible teaching could be done by others. Simpson is, and his alliance refused to be satisfied with the dry bones of eschatology. In theology, they were pragmatists. Their doctrines must work. They must result in practical activity in line with the purposes of God for this age. This is what they believed and what they taught. And their teaching had amazing power to catch and hold and direct the spiritual energies of increasing numbers of men and women. So this is a tough one for Eric to know how to deal with. You know, if I'm going to try and convince you that what A.B. Simpson is saying, that if we, as the body, evangelize, then the king comes. Uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's a, it, there are some debate points in it. At the same time, I see exactly what he is saying. It's a responsive notion, which there's a whole bunch of that in Christianity. If my people do this, it's like, well, look, am I going to move God to action? Well, you could look at it two ways. You could look at it that it's all up to you and you know, God's like, hey, if you don't do something, nothing's going to happen. Or you could recognize that the only way for you to wake up and even consider doing something is because the Holy Spirit is working on you already. In other words, prayer is the work of God even though it's through man. And it's through man's yieldedness and obedience. And prayer is always the prairie fire that starts the revival. And so as a result, where does prayer come from? You could say it's man. Well, you could. Or you could say it's God working upon man and in man and through man to accomplish his agendas. So as a result, I can get in, on board with the notion that God actually is saying, look, for me to return, we need to accomplish this first. So if we're going to accomplish this, let's get it done so I can come. And as far as practically, like they're saying, pragmatically for us as believers, that just makes sense. It's like, okay, let's get our act on, guys. We have a job to do because I really am excited to get the king here. I am really excited for him to come. So let's go to work. So we'll call this responsive theology. And it actually changes the world. There is a reason why the missionary movement back in this time period was so fierce and strong. And so you're going to literally see young men and women leaving their lives and going on the mission field, many of them even dying. I mean, it's an extreme givenness to Jesus Christ. So where do these things come from? Let's look at Matthew 9. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So in other words, you can understand why someone could conclude that for laborers to be sent, there's a need for prayer. And prayer is the instigator to the harvesters, to the laborers of that harvest to be awakened and stirred. And as a result, we see that, well, that means we should be praying. And if we pray, God will raise up harvesters. That's how most people throughout history have interpreted that, right? It's like, we should pray for this and God will do it. And yet, that could sound like God's putting it in our camp to do it. So if we don't do it, there's not going to be any laborers. And that's a part truth, except for the fact that God is still over all of this, and he's moving upon us, and he never allows that light to go out. And so as a result, I mean, if you try and explain your Christian life, it'd be fascinating to hear it. 
You know, is your Christian life a result of just your goodness and your givenness? You seeing the goodness of God and you agreeing with God and then you obeying? Or is it God convincing you of the fact that you are in a sorry state and in need of a Savior? And by the way, while we're you know, bringing you to that point of conclusion that you need a Savior, I am that Savior, says Jesus. In other words, how did you come to the knowledge that you have now? How were you stirred unto action in the first place? God. So as far as I'm concerned, if we're going to be used to, to pray, to raise up laborers, and we get excited about that and go, well, then let's pray, I would say, who's the one that should be responsible for getting us to that conclusion in the first place? It's going to be God. So as a result, though it be true that we need to be praying for laborers to be raised up, we also want to be praying as a result of God's movement, his inciting within our soul, his encouragement, his exhortation, his correction, that we're spending our prayers on, on other areas instead of on the center of what's in his heart. Here's another one in 2 Peter 3, 11 through 13. Since all these things will be dissolved... What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for, and listen to this, and hastening or urging forward the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. But what an interesting phraseology that. How are we supposed to live? What is our holy conduct and godliness? How would God live in one of these bodies? But we are not just looking for the coming of the Lord or the end, but we are hastening it, urging it forward. Well, what could we do to urge it forward? And that's where the great missionary movements of history past have come in. It's like God is saying, you can participate in this. And all of us are like, I want to. There is something about knowing that we can participate in bringing about the king's return that is rather inspiring to us. In other words, I'm not going to take credit. If, if the king comes, I don't think I'm going to stand up on a podium and say, by the way, I just want to take the credit and just thank my wife and you know, my kids for standing with me in this great work that I did to bring the king back. I mean, how ridiculous would that be, right? Some of you are like, boo. We know that Christ is the motivator. Christ is the instrument by which this is done. He's the power to get it done. He's the one that starts the work. He just happens to choose to do it through us. The outcome is all of his glory. I think I, I've shared the story. You guys will recognize it, but it's a good story to illustrate that. Hudson and the red shovel. Uh, so the Ludi driveway is quite uh, a grand driveway, right? And so when we get a uh, heavy snowfall, and this is before I had a, a snowblower, uh, you go out there and I had my red shovel. And I was all alone because Hudson, my oldest child, is like three, you know, and so it's, he's really not that much help, right? However, I delight to do things with my son. I delight to share the task with my son, even though he's three. And so he had a little mini red shovel. It looked just like daddy's, but it was like a little miniature version of it. Like you shrunk it down. It's like this little thing. So we go out and he's going to help daddy shovel. And the first thing, you know, I, I take, and I'm teaching him how to do it. You sort of carve into this. It's one of those, it was a terrible snowstorm to have a little boy try and help with, right? Because it was like one of those two-tiered type of things where it's so deep and so heavy that you have to carve out the first layer, and then you do a second layer. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but this is big time snow, right? So Hudson takes a little off the top, throws it up in the air, and it lands right where I just shoveled, right? I'm like, no, buddy, you want to throw it off to the, the side. And so after a few more times of throwing it right at daddy's feet, uh, you know, he, he gets the desire to go back in and see mama. You know, he needs to check on something uh, with mama. So he goes in there, and then he comes back out and helps me throw some snow on my feet again, and then goes back in. At the very end, as daddy finishes up the driveway, and see, if we, if, you know, when, when daddy finished up the driveway, we were going to get uh, hot chocolate. And so we finish up the driveway, and I go, buddy, we did it. And go tell mama that we're done. And so he goes running, mama, 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 daddy and I shoveled the driveway. Now, Okay, all of you understand the situation that daddy delights to share the victory with my son. However, we all know that practically, Hudson didn't contribute actually that much to the finished task, but he participated in it. And as a result, though the glory is all going to go, well, uh, let me separate stories here. In the Great Commission, the glory should all go to the one who actually did the shoveling. Most of us would probably acknowledge that all we did was throw up snow into the air and have it land on his shoe. 
And yet he delights to share the hot chocolate with us in the end and have us share in the bragging and have mama come up and hug and say, good job, Hudson. You know, and then daddy's standing over like, well, hey, you know, what, what about me? <clears throat> the dangerous edge. From dusty studies to dangerous places. It's very critical that we recognize the difference between being studious and theologically correct about missions and being available. There's just two different things. Because most of us in here, if not 100% of us in here, agree that God has made his commission known. And so some of us think that by agreeing, mentally agreeing, that we are somehow doing. And yet that is the same as hearing instead of doing the word of God. And it is critical that we freshly allow the spirit of God to break through that crust of justification that we have of being theologically correct instead of being lifestyle correct. You see, there is something that the church today is very uh, sensitive to doctrinal heresy. Oh, doctrinal heresy, which of course I think is bad too. I'm not going to say, no, no, doctrinal heresy is totally fine. Doctrinal heresy is terrible, but what we excuse is behavioral heresy. And no one th throws up a, a fit about behavioral heresy, and yet God is going to say, well, Jesus himself is going to say, you will know my disciples, not by the, past that they can, not by the fact that they can pass a, a theological exam, but because of their love for one another. You see, it's evidenced in and through an action. That's, that fruit that is born through their life is a dead giveaway that they are the disciples of Christ. And so as a result, when we are given a commission and then we agree with it but don't do it, I, I think the Spirit of God should put his finger on that. Now, even though I don't want to declare that I know what we're supposed to do in response to this message, I do know that there is a response to this message. And that response may be as simple as, okay, Lord, whatever justification I have, which could be a really good one, I just want to set all those in front of you. And I want to freshly declare that my life is yours. This body is yours. It was bought with a price. My future is yours. My time is yours. My resource is yours. I am not my own. I belong to you, Lord. And I recognize that you have a purpose on this earth that you desire to accomplish. And I don't want to get in the way of that. I want to participate in that. There's an unfinished task, and generations before us have gone after it with gusto, but they intended to hand off the baton to the next generation, and somehow we dropped it. We may be the generation that picks it up again, God willing, and runs this race the way we were intended to run it. Father, I ask that you would stir within us that you would not allow us to stagnate where we're at, to justify our position. Lord, we don't want to live a seated Christianity, but a sprinting one, a climbing one, a leaping one. Lord, we want to be activated by your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord Jesus, search us and try us and know us. Don't let us get away and hide in the shade. We want to come out into the light and allow you to examine us afresh. Lord, we want you to get the glory that is due your name. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen.